The chance and the opportunity that I've been giving as a Somali person in the West, particularly in America, where you know, it's, America is different from anywhere else, especially from Europe. You know, it's it's a land that land of immigrants. Anybody can come, and if they work hard and you know follow the you know the the rules, they can hopefully make something of themselves. And so, it really moved me that these young people who their parents struggle and went through so much um, to actually walk away from everything and go back to Somalia to die. Um, so um, so I, I just wanted to put that, I wanted to make sure I captured that. Thank you so much. We're very happy that you were so brave to tackle such a big topic, such a complicated topic for your first documentary. Um, but it also goes to show that uh, if, 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 there's, you know, if there's something that's motivates you, that uh, nothing can stop you. Mona, maybe if I can uh, get your thoughts a little bit on uh, how you entered uh, the, your field. Um, it's one thing to be studying journalism and to have the aspirations mm -hmm. to become a journalist, but it's something completely different to be able to actually work, as Fathia said, um, in, your voc in your vocation. Mm -hmm. And you are with a very big network, a well-known network. Mm -hmm. how, how did that come about and what were some of the challenges or and opportunities also that you, um, that you've, that you were faced with? Definitely. So, um, like with Hia, I wanted to be a storyteller from a young age. It was especially, you know, talking about politics and news. It was something uh, that was a big deal in my family. You know, I can remember from an early age watching the news and watching the election cycle with my dad, my mom, and um, it was a really big deal for me to, you know, just sit there and watch it with them. So I. Um, majored in communications and political science, so to you know, eventually get into journalism. But it was a pretty rough transition because I didn't go to a school that was um, journalism based. So I was kind of behind in that sense, but I interned at a, actually before that, I started my own online news platform because I didn't have experience. I didn't have an internship under my belt. So I ended up um, starting my own online news platform, just talking about news, sports, politics, wherever I could talk about. And then I got an internship at a local ABC affiliate. And that's where I literally just had to dive in, learn about um, what a VOSA was, what a package was, how to put a story together, what made a story compelling. And it was boot camp for me, because again, I was starting for a little bit behind. But also, I knew that I didn't want to just stay there. I wanted to be able to be in front of the camera, really tell the story, put the whole story together, interview people, choose who I wanted to interview. Um, and so in order to do that, you just can't have a paper resume and say, hey, like, I'm qualified for the job. I had to put together a actual visual reel, so a visual resume. And so I was working seven, eight hour, eight hour shifts, longer than that, and then going out with a local reporter, going out shooting stand-ups, um, doing all the work with them and then coming back and, you know, maybe 10 seconds in front of the camera just to show them, you know, I can tell a story, you know, they can hear my voice. Then started sending it out and I got hired by an ABC station in Virginia. And it's been amazing since. I mean, I get to do what I love every single day. And I think that is when I realized the power of storytelling. That's when I realized the power of journalism. Every day I get to meet someone new, I get to share their story, I get to put it on a platform that they don't have access to, say they have an issue. I think the stories that I'm drawn to the most are um, stories that involve public officials, holding them accountable. You know, they go on, they run these platforms, and they say they're going to do X, Y, and Z, um, and people's lives depend on it sometimes. And so going out there and, you know, holding them accountable if that's not what they do. Uh, we have a big presidential election coming up as well, so I've been busy with politics. Um, but I think you mentioned some of the adversities that we face. I think um, one of the biggest adversities is fighting for stories that I want to cover, stories that are important to me, my community, whether that be the smaller community, 
the Muslim community, whether that be the African American community, women. Um, diversity in the newsroom is something I talk about any opportunity I get. It's an issue that has been around since the first newspaper was ever published because if people are not sitting at that table, there's, it's amazing to me, I think, one of the reasons, one of the things I noticed um, going into journalism is in the morning meeting that we have, we throw out story ideas. Those stories end up on the news. There's no, pla there's no filter, there's no one stopping it. So if you're not, if you don't have a seat at the table, then either your, the stories that affect your community either don't get covered or even worse, they get misrepresented. So um, it's, it's very important to have people at the table who, have, who see things through a different lens, who bring different experiences to their, um, even you know, going on from just not even the newspaper. TV uh, news is very visual, and so it's more impactful, but there's no diversity. There's some areas with um, not a single reporter of color sitting at the newsroom, but that doesn't mean the community doesn't, isn't diverse. San Diego's one of them. I was surprised to see, you know, maybe they might plug in a Hispanic journalist here. They might plug in an Asian journalist. But one of the most prominent stations in both San Diego and LA, and of course Los Angeles, the second biggest city in the United States, um, one of their stations didn't even have a single black reporter. And so that's just one community that's either going to get misrepresented or not, um, or just not even get covered at all. It's really, really fascinating because we've, during Somali Week Festival, have had other conversations about whether mainstream media, as it were, can be reformed, and therefore you take your seat and try to get a seat at the table, or whether it's better to use other alternative platforms. Um, and that's a very delicate balance, and people take very different views on that. Also here in Britain, in the UK, there have been quite big scandals with mainstream um, media outlets. So this is, Sagal, I think, also where social media comes in, and also... Uh, what I find very fascinating is that there is another platform, not discounting mainstream media, but there is another platform now that is more accessible, maybe more democratic, um, and their barriers don't necessarily exist as much as you would uh, have with mainstream media, as what, uh, what Mona has touched upon. What has your experience been into uh, getting into social media? Um, the thing about social media is you get to represent who you are there's nobody telling you that you can't do certain things and that's the reason why i started as well because i wanted to inspire young girls and say look you wear a hijab and that's absolutely fine but you can also be in the fashion industry as well they tend to embrace diversity and because you're different that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing that's actually a very good thing when vogue in featured me on their website it wasn't because oh, she's completely, you know, we want some, she's completely different. No, it was because, yes, she is different. Let's embrace that. Let's put that into the fashion industry. And you've also got to remember, I'm Somali. I come from a very long history of fashion. I remember seeing pictures of my grandmother, may God rest her soul, and she was fashionable. She honestly was. And that's also because she traveled the world. And she just picked up all these ideas and inspirations and she kind of turned it into something that was her and that's the good thing about social media you get to represent who you are there's no barrier to telling you no you can't do that and I've got three nieces and obviously I want them to know that you can grow up and you can be in the fashion industry and you, it doesn't mean that oh because you wear a hijab you're confined into just one particular space no it means that you can be so many different things you have to embrace creative creativity you've got to be different you have to embrace your hijab and you have to make turn it into something that is for you just because you wear a hijab that doesn't mean that no you can't make it into the fashion industry i had an interview with telegraph uh, not so long ago and they were saying how all of a sudden modest fashion has been introduced to the world no modest fashion has always been there They've put a label on it. You have to understand that we come from a very, 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 we come from a very, very, very long line of fashion. Just go back and go back to your mom and ask her, can I see some pictures of you back in the 60s? She will show you pictures. And honestly, 
if I could be that, I would choose that over any, any face I see on, on the fashion industry. I would choose what my mum wore in the 60s, what my grandmother wore in the 40s. Use that and turn it into something that, you're, that is yours. And soon enough, every single platform, every sing, whether it's Vogue, any other fashion label, will ask about us. They will. And we will get there because awareness is there and we will get there. Absolutely remarkable, Saga. But what I think both you and Muna also seem to be um, indicating is that you've created your own opportunities. You didn't just sit there and wait for yeah. acceptance or to be invited to the table. You had to actually initially prove yourself and, and set up your own base, whether it's your fan base and people who follow you, whether it is your visual resume. Um, so that's also that shows that, uh, that 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 you have to also do something to be heard. Um, Mo, sitting here with me, you are probably, as a feature filmmaker, in a very, very tough industry. Um, and even more so, particularly when we talk about BME, black and ethnic minority representation. What has your experience been like? How, what, what was the journey for you? And why did you want to take on such a difficult challenge? Assalamu um, alaikum. Um, I mean, how I started was, I mean, for me, my background was, I, you know, I lived in a poor place in Saudi Arabia, and the only thing that I could mentally do was escape from the boring, mundane, you know, poor life that I had was watch films like Rambo and Terminator, and it's silly, but it's the only thing that I could escape with with my mind. And all my life, I wanted to kind of create that and kind of like make films. So I came to London, you know, tried to do the whole college thing, got, you know, studied media for two years, then went into university through the work. Not that my qualifications, actually my work that took me to university. But then in uni, I found out one thing in film, which was the teachers that were teaching me weren't filmmakers. So I didn't want to learn from them. So I came back to London and I just worked for three years for free as a runner. And a runner is someone that makes cups of coffees on set, carries camera equipment. You work about 14 hours a day. And the only reason that they hired me is not because I studied media, it's because I was free. Yeah. I said, look, take me on board, but you don't have to pay me. So anyone that was smart would hire me because they would not hire a Somali Muslim, Runta. In, a, in reality, they would rather hire, the, not a race thing, it was just very incestuous that they would hire people that they knew. So my angle was I was free and I was cheap. So for three years, I would rush there, work, carry, sweat, come home on a night bus with no money, then do that again for three years, that, to the point where I got that respect and knowledge that I went out and bought a camera and went out shooting music videos. And again, I offered my services out for free, and then within four months, people started to pay me, and I did like over 80 music videos from five grand to 55 grand, and then you know I was doing everything. And then a film company came up to me and was like, would you like to do a music, uh, feature film? So from doing three minute content to 90 minute content, just blew my mind, you know? But I was confident and I knew that I had the skill to do it. So we made that film and it became like a top 10 box office hit, which was for me was incredible. Um, just to see that, that it was number five on the UK charts was mad, but Hoy didn't have a clue what it meant, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I come running, I was like, what's this? She goes, why are you not a doctor? I don't understand, get out. <laughs> but um, that kind of changes the whole level of game plan for me because once I did that film, it was interesting. Uh, the industry just came to me and were like, do you want to do a terrorist film? Do you want to do a pirate film? You know, That's all they thought that I wanted to do. You know? So it frustrated me so much because you know, they, they have this image that if you're Somali, that's all you know. You know, if you're an artist, that's, as a Somali artist, that's all you could talk about. So I refused that. I went off and wrote my own script, sold it, and made that film for, you know, just last year. But getting into this industry, what you find is, as a BAM actor, uh, film director, is even the West Indians, are not, they have a community. There is just one Somali filmmaker in Britain. So I'm just the only one in a weird way. There is a next generation that's coming up, so 
it's incredibly isolating, but I'm proud to be the first, you know, Somali filmmaker in Britain or Europe making feature films. And I'm proud of that, and I want to bring more Somalis. So even though my premise was in my first film is to always have a Somali actor on set, working on set. I've been in front of the camera, behind the camera. So alhamdulillah, with my two films, I've done that. And I'm going to continue doing that. So, um, <laughs> you know, if, if they're not going to hire us, I'm going to hire us, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so that's it. Excellent. For all of you aspiring directors, actors, producers, you know, uh, hold Mo up to his uh, invitation. Um, I find that very fascinating, Mo, and I think also briefly when before this panel we had a bit of a discussion. On the one hand, you're touched by the experiences that your community has faced and we're all tarred with the same brush. So if there's a negative experience taking place in the community, it doesn't matter whether you are directly involved or not. It's something that touches you whether you like it or not. But at the same time, you don't want to give uh, fuel to the stereotypes. So doing films about piracy or, you know, the, the narrative then becomes so limiting. And I just was curious as a kind of as a final wrap up for me, and then we open it up to the floor. Um, as panelists, what were your thoughts on, on, on tackling some of these difficult issues? And especially also how, when you do tackle these difficult issues, how are you treated by the community? I said to you, are you damned if you do, damned if you don't, whether you touch on these issues that, that, that are relevant to the Somali community. Well, thank you. Well, in a, in a, in a way, yes, because, I, I mean, especially as a woman, <laughs> you're expected to, you know, do certain things, and, um, you know, if you kind of stray from that, then you're, you know, considered, you know, not being a good Muslim woman and um, you know I, I have you know these debates on my Facebook very often you know I, I, I do storytelling on Facebook that become very popular and um, you know it's usually just very human stories about being what it means to be a Somali person and I usually end that with a, a, a you know Somali song um, Karami often <laughs> and so it, you know it's you you will you will see that majority of the times people there's this sense of hunger you know that that we want to hear our, our own stories and we love it but then there's Saeed uh, Ahmed Samatar said the other night you know which was uh, uh, remarkable he said there's almost a dead hand you know <laughs> on the Somali people gripping us to like you know, just stay there, and it's very difficult to kind of, you know, get rid of it. So it's, uh, you know, I, I do a few different things personally. I mean, I do, I do films, and then I have, uh, you know, my storytelling, and then I, I sing for fun, not as a singer, but, you know, uh, because to me, the way I see music, the Somali Sugan especially, I think, I think it's the, the one thing that we are still the best, we're, we're as good as anybody when it comes to music and, and Sugan, Somali Sugan. Many other things we are, you know, we've lost our, our ways and, and our grip, but when it comes to poetry or, or, or you know, music, um, we are just incredibly creative. And so I try to remind the Somali people, especially the young, younger generation, um, I mean, I'm not young, but the younger generation, I try to remind them, you know what? We had our heydays, I mean, and we still can be inspiring, and, 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 and we come from someplace wonderful, and, and we have a beautiful story. And our story doesn't have to be this just one single story, because it's very, very dangerous, dangerous when you just, when, when an entire society just becomes one story, you know, a piracy or death and destruction and, 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 and that's it. So yes, there are Somalis who will complain and say, you know, how dare you, you're a woman, you're not supposed to be uh, showing your face in public or, 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 or how dare you sing like that with such a nice voice, you should only be, you should only read Quran in that voice and, and, and never say anything else. And so, <laughs> but you just, and then you'll hear stories about other 
young people will get, get, will get in touch with you and say, you know, I don't even speak Somali, but I understand what you're saying. And you, you made me proud, and thank you so much. So, you, you know, you just, anybody who wants to, there's a Somali Mahmad that says, you know, you, <laughs> you, you, you put yourself out there. I mean, you, you have to have a thick skin, you know, you, you know, and so. I think you're damned if you don't. You have to control your own narrative, and otherwise someone else will control it for you, and that's where the piracy movies come from. That's where the terrorism movies come from, and you don't want to associate, you know what I mean? Like, you don't want the connotation Somali to be terrorists. So I think you have to go out there and explain to people that there is no single narrative. Maybe I'm sharing mine. Yes, you hear the negative comments, but there's an overwhelmingly amount of positive comments every day, just like reading through people saying that it's so inspirational to see you do something that maybe traditionally we haven't done before. You know, there's an entire new generation that are either born in the, in the Western world, they'll say like the States or the UK, who now are part of mainstream culture and part of that culture. So it's important for them to bring that experience, being Somali American, being Somali British, to the table. Um, yes, negative comments will come. But if you ask any group of people, whether it be even, I don't know, Britney Spears, you ask any pop culture, anyone who puts themselves out there is going to be subject to criticism. It's human nature to criticize. But I think that it's not damned if you do, damned if you don't. It's just damned if you don't. Like, you have to get out there and control your narrative. Otherwise, yeah. someone else will do it for you. True. You have to be very, very thick-skinned as well. People will have opinions, and you have to understand that they've got their opinions, and you've got to, you've got, you can't just say, no, you can't have your opinion. This is what I do, and what I do is right. You just have to explain to them, yes, you can have your opinion, but let me just, let me show you my side of things. And I think that's the best way to get our selves across to other people and tell them that we are from a very beautiful country that has a very, very, very beautiful history. Well, we've got an incredibly supportive crowd here. So with this crowd, you can never go wrong. Um, so maha. <laughs> That's my trust in you. But I'm sure that you have a lot to contribute, lots of thoughts, lots of ideas, lots of questions. So I'm going to open it up to you now. And if you wouldn't mind, we'll take a collection of questions um, so that we can maximize and optimize our time. And who should we start off with? And I'm going to have to ask you to come to the microphone, if that's OK, so that we can all hear you. So first intervention. Yes, of course. Please come forward. Yeah, it's very brief. Sorry, it's, it's just something Coser uh, said. You said you get to choose the people you interview, right? And the stories you do. And I remember, it was a few years ago when I was in journalism school, the introduction class. The professor asked a question, and it stuck with me to this day. It said, "Can journalism ever be uh, objective?" Right? And all of us were focused on what you're doing after you've chosen the story. Mm -hmm. And we're like, you know, the people she's interviewing, the story she's doing. And what you don't realize is objectivity happens even before. Because you chose the people you want to interview, the stories you want to cover. That in itself tells you, you know, are you attractive or not? And for you saying that, it stuck with me and I just had to make a comment. So thank you. I always, that's a great point you brought up. Sorry, real quick. Just, that's a great point you brought up because everyone has implicit bias. So you try to stay as objective as you can, but we all have our biases. But again, that's why you want people with different experiences who see things through a different lens to be at the table because it's not even about how we cover stories. It's how we select stories to begin with. So you're right. It's a great point you brought up that you know I pick and choose who I want to interview and how I cover the story. But from the beginning, I choose the story and I fight for it to make sure that it's covered to begin with. When I was working for Voice of America, um, I had to cover a story about this young Somali girl who was um, uh, stoned to death by Al Shabab. And um, I remember when the the stringer, the journalist, uh, the reporter who was reporting the story from um, Kismayo, when she called and um, and 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 told us the story, and I had to actually interview her. 
um, I, I was literally shaking, you know. Uh, this 15-year-old girl was raped, and then she went to the authority. That's where authorities, which was Al-Shabaab at the time. This is 2008, and um, she, w she was made an example. She was brought to public, you know, in, in the middle of the city, and was actually stoned to death. And, um, and so I was, I, I, I had the chance to be able to um, interview the, the head of Al-Shabaab in Kismayu at the time. And I was just so mad. And I was, on the one hand, I mean, I was trying to remain objective. <laughs> but, it, you know, it's very, very hard sometimes, you know, very, very hard because, you know, there are certain things that no matter how hard you try to, that make it very, very difficult for you to, you know, remain objective. And so, um, I mean, you're right. You try to do your best, but um, you, we all have our own biases. I'll tell you one thing. You know that story? I'll tell you a funny story about that. Um, about three years ago, I wrote a play for that, about her story, because I wanted to highlight the horrors. Yeah, Aisha. And I went to this big, big theater company, huge. I'm not going to name him. So... And we wrote it, and we want to make it very kind of passionate, but also kind of tell the story how the Somali people at that day in that stadium fought against, tried to stop her, like the Al Shabaab, from killing her. And apparently they shot fires and stuff like that, to the point where I wanted to make it as honest as possible, make our people look like we're not savages. There were people fighting to save her, but this theatre company decided to edit that bit out. They wanted to show the horror of us. So I ripped up the contract. I was like, I'm not doing that, you know? And it's a bit of a shame that we can never show that truth, you know? It's, it has to be watered down into their own way. But it was a powerful story. And one day, I'd love to do it, but it was a very frustrating experience, you know? We're going to do it. We'll do it, yeah. You do it. You do it. Um, Salaam alaikum. Um, firstly, thanks to each and every one of you for what you do. I think uh, you, this is the this is the beginning of the journey of changing the narrative of the Somali people and 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 getting our voices to the mainstream surfaces and medias. But I wanted to ask how how do we balance out owning our narrative and our issues? Because some of those issues, Al Shabaab, piracy, FGM. Many of those stories do exist. So how how do we get the balance? We get we got you guys here. You go to the mainstream media's. You're trying to betray the positive image of Somalis, which is true, and the success that we are making here in the UK, in the United States of America, or anywhere in the world. But at the same time, we have our our, whole, our house is not in order. So how 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 do we get that balance? And how do, when, when do we, when is the stage that, that we will say, this is my issue, I own it, it's my problem, I'll fix it, I'll talk about it. So how do, how do you get to the, you're trying your best, but how do you get to the ordinary Somalis to look at themselves and say, yes, Al-Shabaab do exist, FGM do exist, piracy do exist, corruption exists, other issues exist, sexual, uh, and then sexual exploitation here exists in the UK with the young Somali girl. So how, how, do, how, how do we say to ourselves, yes, it, they do exist, and we, we need to own that, and we need to come out and say, yes, that, there are bad things, but at the same time, there are mo, there are obsia, there are sagal, there are, uh, there are cows, uh, there are cowseries, there are millions of us who are doing a fantastic job. So, uh, that, that, <laughs> so how, how do we get there? I'll just throw, oh, sorry. I'll just start by saying, you know, it's true, it's out there. And all the things you mentioned are very true. And it's not about being afraid to confront it because I think that he and Mo both said that they wanted to cover the story of Asha who was stoned to death for, some, for a crime she didn't commit. She didn't commit any crime, you know? And it's not about covering it. It's almost when terrorism, when piracy becomes our only narrative is when it's a problem. So it's not about um, being afraid to confront the issues, you will confront it. You will say, you know, this is still happening in our society, we need to. For example, I think your documentary is a great example of that. You know, it's admitting first that, hey, these kids did go from their homes in Minnesota, went abroad, you know, we always ask, what did the parents do? And you see that on the documentary, they're answering and they explain, 
Um, but it's just when the only thing you talk about is terrorism and it's that's when you're like, like I don't I don't know anyone who's involved in that. Like that's not my daily life. So why is it that um, that's the only issues that are covered or people care about, you know? So I think it's when it's your only narrative that's a problem. I don't think any of us have an issue of confronting these issues and holding people accountable, but it's about um, when the focus, like why, hyper focus on why it. Why can't we just focus on the good side of things as well? I mean, I, I don't understand. Why do we have to focus on the bad side of things? I mean, that, I think a lot of people focus on the bad things as it is already. So maybe as Somalis, maybe we need to focus on the good things and that way we can shed more light on it. You know, um, like everybody here, it's kind of, I'm tired of talking about that stuff every day. I'm being commissioned and told you should make it. You know, I want to do a Somali comedy. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I'd love to do a comedy with you if you want to do one. Um, I want to do that. I want to make us laugh. You know, I want to... Why can't we laugh, for God's sake? Do you see what I mean? It's kind of... You know, like, I'd love to do a funny, like, a Somali wedding film. About, you know, the stuff that happens in there is hilarious. But that's the kind of, like, I want to show the beauty that we have, the sense of humour, the culture, you know... That is the beautiful side that I'm more going after now. Or the thing that we're best known for, poetry. Yeah. yeah. Focus on poetry. I mean, you know, and poetry. Gubba, gubba, say that, say. I'm learning, I'm learning, everybody. Uh, but the thing is, I mean, like, those subjects are very powerful and strong, you know? We have to do changes, but if we all sing the same song every day, it gets, not boring, but there's no real spark anymore, you know? And it's, it has to kind of, let's kind of try new avenues, you know, you could do a very hard hitting story, but do it in a different twist, you know, so everything doesn't have to be serious and dark. I think we've got, we've got better colours in our pattern, I think, you know. <laughs> Go on. But here, I, if okay. I may just briefly piggy bank on that question okay. and also in relation to your oh, documentary. Because I think there's, on the one hand, communicating outside of the community, um, and then there's the internal communication. And what was obvious from your documentary is that there was a lot of tension about what actually had happened, mm -hmm. where the source of the problem lay, mm -hmm. and to some degree, accusations being made and denial of those accusations. Mm -hmm. So the point that was made by, um, by, by, uh, by uh, our, the gentleman over here mm -hmm. is to some degree, I think, applies a lot also internally within our community where we cannot be in denial of some of the issues that affect us us the most, mm -hmm. how do we then discuss these very difficult questions? And what has your experience been making the documentary? <laughs> it's, 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 a very, it's, a, it's a very good question. Well, the, the, the thing is, I think, um, yes, it, it's true all these things do exist, but there's a lot more. We have so many, there's, there are so many sides to every story and, and, and to every group of people. But at the same time, I think, the problem with the problem we have as Somalis is we kind of live in denial and we don't seem to like want to take responsibility of our own you know actions um, we tend to kind of say oh what the hell it's okay it happened just move on dip male I can't stand that word dip male yes it has, it's a serious problem, and we need to be able to, instead of waiting for other people to give us money to tell our stories, well, give me the money so I can tell my good story. No, it doesn't work like that. We have to spend our own money if we want to tell our story the way we want to tell it, and, and, and so we can tell it all the angles that it needs to be told, because even a piracy story or, or a terrorism story, there's so many angles to it. You know, when a young man, uh, 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 it, Wakes, he doesn't, young people don't just wake up one morning and say, oh, to hell with this place, I'm just going to go and join Al-Shabaab. There are so many other factors, you know. So when you want to tell a story, there are so many angles to, to every story. Um, and if you want to be, if you want to tell that story, you, we have to individually, we have to come together and we have to realize that stories do matter. And stories are the most powerful tool to change mindsets, and especially movie, films. Films have the power to impact 
and moved people and inspired them to do amazing things. Because, I mean, think about it. When you see a movie, <laughs> I mean, you, you're shaken up. You're like, oh my God, I'm going to change my world. I'm going to call so and so and tell them to forgive me. Whatever, whatever the movie you've seen is about. You want to take action. And so I think Somali organizations and companies have to realize that films and storytelling story is very, very important and have to and, and, and have to be willing to spend money. And individually, nowadays, Mo knows that, you know, you can have crowdfunding and, and raise a good amount of money, $20, $30, $50 from individuals, just like you, all of us, and, and actually come up with decent amount of money to make the kind of story you want to make. And that way, we're all stakeholders, and we can make the stories that we, wanna, we want the world to see. And I think young, young people will be inspired if our story is not only told and, and uh, you know, within us, but when you tell the story in the global stage, it's more powerful than when you're just you know, having a little get together and you're sharing your stories. You know? So um, thank you. Even, I, the, I kind of like have a responsibility. You're right, I do. But I, don't, I try and meet young Somali filmmakers and not tell them I'll put the gun down, nothing. I put a camera in their hand or a pen and paper and go write something to change the world. That's how you'll change it creatively. Do you see what I mean? That's how I kind of try to change stuff, you know? I don't rally everybody together. I just put a camera in their hand or a pen and paper or said visually, you know? Go and create, you know? Let people know how you feel and that's how I think. That's how I do my change, you know? So that's what's important to me. Take another round. I can see some. Sorry, we're being blinded by the light, so we can't see the audience very well. Uh, there's, yes, the gentleman. I'm not here to ask a question. I'm here because I've got two teenage daughters. Want to share with me? She goes to uh, school in grammar school in Colchester. And it's amazing to see these girls. When I find out that they're coming tonight here, I ask her, come with me and see these girls. So that's the reason I'm here. <laughs> Secondly, the school she goes, she's the only a Somali one. They're the only Somali one. So every time people will say, what is good about your country? What is good about your country? And they come to me and I, they say to me, Dad, Tell us anything about Somalia. And I think about a long, long time, and I say to them, just say to them, to them we are the nation of poets. There's nobody like us. So that's the reason. <laughs> that's the reason you see me today, win today in London, dressed at Maui's. <laughs> Thank you very Can much. Can I just take a picture with you on my Instagram? Because clearly the outfit is Thank really good. Thank you very good. much. <laughs> Just taking this opportunity, I just want to ask you a question that BBC Somali asked Raga Omar think six years ago. The question was, when you meet people with big names, when you interview in or whatever, and when you tell them that you're from Somalia, or let me say Somaliland, mm -hmm. or wherever you're from, uh, what do you feel inside? You know where you're from. It's not as good as we would want it. And how do that people react when they get know that you're from Somalia? Thank you very much. I feel a sense of pride. <laughs> Just wrap it up. <laughs> so, oh yeah, no, Second that's all I wanted proud. to say. I <laughs> do feel yeah. a sense of pride, definitely. <laughs> it's weird because um, when I kind of hire uh, big actors and stuff like that, you know, they obviously kind of work out on Muslim Mo and all that. So when they see me, it's kind of, who's this guy? And they go, where are you from? I go, Somalia. And they go, oh, I've never worked with a Somali before. And I go, you will, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> but it's kind of, it, it, well, I, my heart beats proudly that I'm Somali and I'm, you know, bossing around all these guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, in a, not in a cocky way, but it just feels good. Yeah. It feels good. And, and I'm now, you know, 
again, this industry is so amazing now for young Somali people that we are coming here with our cameras and, you know, so many filmmakers here. And it's so good when I'm filming on set, the last one, that we had one or two guys in the back with their own cameras or carrying kit. That's just amazing. So the whole industry is starting to see Somali filmmakers. So that's, that's brilliant to me, man. Um. Uh, I feel like nowadays people finally know what Somalis are before. It'd be like, oh, she's Samoan. I'm like, that's an island. <laughs> and no, that is not it. Or um, especially like more when we go outside central Virginia, they really have never seen, they don't even know. They're like, oh, the Indian lady, come here. And so, um, but yeah, like you said, I feel a sense of pride. I feel a sense of responsibility because, again, you are, I mean, you're not a representation. You shouldn't weigh that on your back because you are you and you're an individual. But um, you, when people do have a certain idea, I mean, there's certain people that are like, oh, so where are you from? You know, they're curious, and you say, oh, I'm small, and they're like, oh, socks, what's happening there? And you're like, is that really, yeah, it sucks what's happening in Guatemala too, but um, it's, so then when they get to know you and they know that they have a lot in common with you and just they are curious and they finally like, you know, get some questions answered, I feel like then they start, it breaks their stereotypes. They think you're gonna act a certain way, you're gonna look a certain way. Um, and then so when they meet you, they're like, oh, I never, you know, and so now um, one of my best friends is really into our culture and so um, he'll be like, oh yes, today I saw like a Somali girl, the, you know, so it's, you just bring them in and you show them that we are, you know, show them the beautiful side of our culture. Yes. Um, I'm still a believer that journalism's impartial, that it's about, you know, covering facts and not trying to put your opinions into it. But I feel um, you're right. We, when we pitch stories, we pitch stories that we think the community is going to care about. So that means, you know, if you're not a part of that community, you're not going to be able to even think about those issues. So, and that is the reason why diversity is so important because, like I said, it's not about just plugging in one person. Yeah, I am one Somali journalist. Um, there was five of us. Might be a little easier, but um, you'd be surprised. I mean, I got away with doing a story about being Muslim in the Bible Belt. So if you're not familiar with that, that's like the southern United States, the south is very evangelical conservative Christian. And there was a small community and I was able to do a series piece. Um, and I was very protective over it. You know, I made sure, I think there was like a tease going on. This guy was writing for me and he was like, you know, they're in your backyards. And I was like, no, 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 no you can't say that because, you know, there's a connotation that goes with that as well. But um, it's baby steps. You try. Obviously, there's some stories I've pitched, but there's plenty more that I've shut down. Um, fellow journalist of mine who's well-respected, educated, was like, you know, let's do a piece on Islam being a violent religion. You're like, it's not though. Like, you know what I mean? So you shut that story down. So it's about just baby steps. I can't do it all, but um, having faith that, you know, if you fight hard enough, if you're convincing enough, that people will understand. So the other story, I was like, you know, a very small community, um, they're your neighbors, they're your school teachers, um, they're everywhere pretty much, but um, it was hard because again, they wanted to pair it with this um, Muslim campground that was, or this compound that was um, associated or was on the FBI's watch list or something. And they're like, all right, let's put those two stories together. And I was like, you can't do that because here are everyday people. And then you have a compound group that, you know, they have their interesting ethics and, um, you know, on the FBI watch list. You just can't, like, this is about a feature piece. So again, it's baby steps. It's about getting more and more people who represent the Somali community, the Muslim community in mainstream media and not just going, well, what's the use? You know, it's commercialized, it's sensationalized. Yeah, that is true. To an extent it is, but that doesn't mean you give up. You still have a say if you fight hard enough, if you can. And I think with social media, as you can, um, as I probably can say too, that really helps because now it's not, say, you know, that story is only getting minimal audience. They're only broadcasting it here. Well, now with social media and Facebook, I'm able to share stories or share my stories that might have not gotten, you know, in the first A block, which is basically the first part of the show. Maybe they buried it somewhere in like the last part of the show. Well, it lives longer too on social media. So for example, that story with Muslim in the Bible Belt, it was shared so many times. It was just, it's like floating around the internet and it's still there on my Facebook page. So where as, you know, 
before there was only one avenue you one can channel, take yeah. to get to, to for your voice to be on a certain platform now you can take control you can put it on social media and get it in front of people who maybe live in the uk maybe live in um denmark or at different countries that would never have seen your stuff they could see it now so it's it's baby steps <laughs> i know facebook's becoming this you know, global village, uh, quite literally. I mean, I, like it's like this borderless world. Um, yeah, Mohammed, thank you so much for the compliment. Well, I'll hurt um, the I appreciate that. He's biased. He's he's, he's he's he he likes me. He's my friend. <laughs> but anyway, um, so, so I haven't made three documentaries. I made this is the only documentary, and then my second uh, uh, piece is a film. Uh, it's called The Lobby, and it's a story about friendship and cultural differences. So it's actually a narrative. Um, uh, you know, it's about this Muslim woman um, uh, who becomes friends with this American gentleman, and, and it basically talks about how stories can bring people together, that our differences are not so much, you know, our, our obvious differences are only till we are able to sit down together and talk to one another. And so, um, uh, and, and my third film is um, called Grapes of Heaven. I'm actually working on the film raising of that film right now, and, it's, and it has to do with Borderi. Hello. <laughs> so yeah, it's, so Afzawali Nawuha and Anab Kichanada. That's the name. So, uh, inshallah, I'm working on that. I'm, I, I, I'm almost done with the script. Um, it's in the developing stages. I'm going to um, uh, Hargeisa, hopefully this December, to raise some money. And, uh, and I'm going to be doing crowdfunding. Um, and uh, inshallah, all of you will be able to contribute. And then you'll, you'll be able to see the film for free. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. I'll give the panel an opportunity to briefly respond and maybe also if you can add to that, what does the future bring for you, inshallah? What are your hopes and aspirations? Uh, just so that I believe you are stars already, but you know we can reach another higher level. So we're curious to know what you're all going to be doing. Mo, if we start with you. Um, I mean, the thing is for me is, okay, I'm not a star, I've just got in. I fought my way in, and now what I want to do is bring everybody through. So there's someone like Amina there, many shots. He's an incredibly talented filmmaker. I want to see him make a film, you know. <laughs> so it's, it's identifying talent like that and getting them through and being in the same room as me, really. That's my goal. But in moving forward in the future, how we, you know, me and a group of Somali team are going to set up uh, a company that's going to commission and look after loads of Somali filmmakers from around the world. <laughs> so that's the real goal that I'm hitting. You know, inshallah, we're going to do that. So, you know, that's the steps, really. Well, I, I second that. I'm not a star yet. I, 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 I'm so proud of this. I mean, I'm, I'm the oldest. Uh, here and uh, I kind of started late because you know, uh, like I said, you know, you when you're a Somali, your dreams have to wait for you to help uncles and family members and relatives. <laughs> and so, um, but yeah, I mean, I'm I'm still fighting hard, and uh, and it, it's even harder for a woman, you know. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm gonna be working, and I'm not separated from my community. I mean, um, I have majority of the Somali people are very loving, kind, decent people who want to support me even though they don't understand uh, film. I mean, why do you want to make films? I mean, we have a lot of other problems that are urgent. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, so um, I'm not that kind of separated from the Somalis, but I try to remain um, private as much as I can. Um, and the other thing is, I'm just going to be working on, on my film, and hopefully I'll be uh, making this film, shooting this film in uh, Berbera uh, this summer, inshallah. I don't think you can ever forget who you are and where you came from. You have to remember that our parents have fled a war-torn country for us. 
they gave us a future and you've got to always remember where you came from. As for my future, I want to bring out a, a line, a, fa a fashion line, where I can bring the Somali culture and fashion together and create something that's for us, by us, and that can be bought by us as well and other people. I'm already queuing up for that. <laughs> Um, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't frustrating at times when you feel like you know you're out there putting your neck on the line for the community and then you see some criticisms and you're like, man, I just like if you only knew what I was doing and then um, but like Sagal said, you can't separate who you are. So I might be physically removed from a Somali community, but you can't just forget who you are and what you grew up yeah. with. I think growing up Somali you always have that bond. Um, and so yeah, I just, I just feel like you will always have that connection. It might be frustrating at times, but at the end of the day, it's about gaining trust in both communities. And once they see, you know, you consistently have a track record of putting issues at the forefront and covering the issues, even as you go up and up and up into a major platform, that trust will be there and it'll, you know, uh, and then hopefully more people will follow and then we could do different little segments of it because it's not just one general Somali story. Um, for the future, I just hope to keep doing what I'm doing. I love telling stories and I feel now a sense of responsibility. I can't leave because I know how imperative it is to control the narrative. I keep saying it, but it's true. It's, you know, um, especially as the Somali communities, both in the UK and the US ra are rapidly growing, you can't just walk away from it because you know that there's not many of us in mainstream media. And so you know that um, it's not like someone else is gonna pick up the slack. It's, you have to fight and be there. Yes. Thank you so much. Well, I think you will all join me, uh, or I speak on behalf of everyone, if I may, if you'll let me. Uh, we're incredibly proud of every single panelist here, and your success is a little bit of our success. So thank you very much. A very, very warm round of applause for the entire panel.